Welcome back to Dairy Public Radio. Reporting from the basement of the Dairy Civic Center, this is CM Alexander with the news. Police in Hemingford Home, Nebraska, have new information on a 100-year-old murder. While developing a property that was once farmland, dairy natives Ben and Beverly Hanscom discovered a horrific gravesite. It appears the body of a missing woman, a cow, and a mattress were all sealed in an old well. DNA evidence links the woman's husband to the crime. While it may be too late for justice to be served, we can only hope that his guilt ate him alive until the end. You're listening to Dairy Public Radio. This is Dairy Public Radio. Welcome back to Dairy Public Radio, a bi-weekly Stephen King book club podcast. I'm one of your hosts, CM Alexander, alongside Joshua Khan. Hey, everybody. Benjamin Graham. Sup, constant readers. And today we are back with another Patreon selection from Tony Horstman with 1922 out of full dark, no stars. And Josh is leading the discussion. Yeah, buddy. I am so excited <laughs> because I didn't realize how much I missed different seasons. Until we had another novella selection, and mm-hmm. I'm so hyped. Yeah, full of movie adaptations, right? Uh, this uh, one, and uh, there's another. There's three out of four, just like different seasons. Hell yeah. So we'll see if we create another spinoff podcast based on whatever <laughs> one doesn't have the movie this oh. time. <laughs> well, Challenge accepted. Yeah. Oh, we should explain, because I didn't do that, that we are going to be talking about the adaptation during this episode as well. Yeah. So... 1922 begins, you guessed it, 1930. (laughs) Because because we open with uh, Wilfred James, who is writing a confession, because in 1922, he murdered his wife, Arlette. Wilfred Leland Gaunt James. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. (laughs) He does end up pretty gaunt by the end of it. He is not a nice fellow, this Wilfred James. Is anybody in this story... Worth reading about. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, mm. Shannon seems lovely. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, by all accounts, Shannon's the best. Oh, yeah. And she makes it out okay. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, uh, l- you know what? Let's, we'll set the scene. Let's talk about the marital rift that exists at the center of the story. We have Wilfred, who is the husband who owns 80 acres, owns his farm outright, owns the house on the property. Arlette, his wife, owns a hundred acres around the property that were willed to her from her father. And uh, and let's discuss the problem. Wilfred wants to own his wife, too. <laughs> well, I, I mean, yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Wilfred is uh, angry that Arlette has never been interested in being a farmer or a farmer's wife. She is very openly kind of disdainful she, disdainful mm. and she she wants to leave she wants to go to the city and this is a uh unforgivable sin uh, <laughs> to this dipshit farmer mm-hmm. and his 14 their 14 year old son mm-hmm. i don't know if this i was wondering how much of this too was just that time cuz she mm-hmm. mentions eventually she's like you could we could each sell our land we could split everything we could get a divorce. I could move to the city and open up a dress shop with our son. <laughs> and you could continue to be a farmer here. And it's so this is 1922, which was mm-hmm. shortly after the ratification of the amendment that gave women the right to vote. So like women's suffrage. So it's very set in like that mindset mm-hmm. still of everybody being real. Ugh, I hate reading about yeah. that. About <laughs> women's role. And mm-hmm. It's interesting. It's written very well. Yeah. And it's it, part of his resentment of her. Well, it's weird. And it's different between the book and the movie, I think. Yeah, M- maybe. I think so a little bit too. Interesting. Because he has this disdain for his wife. The whole plot of the book comes about where they're having this argument. And Wilford is like... He makes it a point several times throughout the story to be like, I didn't care about the neighbors talking. Mm -hmm. I I, I didn't want 
uh, to to get a divorce and go to the law about this. And it's super not that I'm a vain uh, person <laughs> who cares about people talking about me. It's just that I hated her. And I feel like the reasoning behind why he hated her is different between the book and the movie. Mm-hmm. Did you guys mm-hmm. feel that way? I, I They no? seemed fine. I'm not sure. It they seemed... It seemed like they were doing something slightly different with their relationship it, between the two. Yeah, it, it. I. I felt like it is because of my one main small complaint about the movie is a few of the the movie is much more restrained. Yeah, right. The, perf- <laughs> the performances are very kind of realistic, low key, mm-hmm. whereas in the book arlene the way he talks about her at least is she is a shrill awful harpy <laughs> yeah that screams at him like it otherwise his hatred of her doesn't make a lot of sense because what we see in the movie at least how i felt is she's just a reasonable woman that fucking hates living on a farm that's a yeah. really good point point. the only good things he points out about her in the book are all of the things that are valued in a a woman and a wife Mm-hmm. in that time that, period. Like they're of value to him. Well, no, <laughs> just like in society, like mm-hmm. it was generally thought of as, it's the cult of true womanhood, which is what mm-hmm. historians call that time period now, just how women were viewed. And it, it was just interesting that those were the qualities that he's like, well, she lets me put it in her whenever <laughs> I want and mm-hmm. keeps a clean house and all of those types of things. But yeah. And the, and the reason he's like resentful of his neighbor is that yeah. not only is he rich or seemingly rich, mm-hmm. uh, although they're about the same, other than the guy has probably taken out loans to, you know, he had, uh, his, buy a car yeah, and get into our His crops plumbing. were substantially, his field substantially larger, so they both had a great season, but he had, mm-hmm. you know, three times as good a season. But... Then he says, but none of that bothered me as much as the fact that his wife was the seemingly big air quotes, you know, platonic ideal of a wife. She listened when he said, and oh, I didn't have that because I had Arlene, who had had autonomy. And and how dare she? Also, Arlette. Arlette, Arlette, what did I say? (laughs) Arlene. Arlene. How did they get together? Oh, I'll, I, they told great, us. Did they? Yeah. I was okay. So I'm glad you guys brought this up <laughs> okay. because it, in bringing up what you just said, Ben, the can the contrast between how we tell the story in the book, it, she is that monstrous kind of depiction, and I wondered where is all this resentment? If she hates this life so much, why the fuck did she marry a farmer? And it's the night that they get her hammered before they murder her and she's talking about oh, yeah. don't put it mm-hmm. in you know because it's not too young to get married at 14 like some people and like it's just very heavily implied mm-hmm. that that's that their, their relationship is that they hooked up when they were children and were married off mm-hmm. that's and right so, I forgot about that just because of how mismatched they clearly it's, are it's so thrown away because mm-hmm. he doesn't give a shit about it he it's ne- all he cares about is that she's not interested in it he is clearly has never thought for a second that it's not because this isn't a life she ever wanted mm-hmm. was never even interested mm-hmm. in probably only hooked up with him because he was tom jane yeah for fuck's sake <laughs> he, yeah he really jacked down for this role though like he was a very like you said ben gaunt yeah, yeah. he's good he's oh, yeah. good in this movie so good. he talks he does a thing with his mouth like he doesn't he, did, he talks like he has chew yeah, he the whole his time jaw. he yeah. talks without his teeth opening yeah. and it is unnerving yeah. honestly <laughs> yeah it's a neat character thing that makes you hate him more you i sorry i just want to say one more thing before we move on about the difference in arlette's mm-hmm. character i liked her for a moment in the book and then she spoke and is like oh <laughs> you are you suck too you're you're a uh, yeah <laughs> you all suck and in the the movie she yeah like you said she just seemed like a normal lady who hated this life she had Mm -hmm. well it's i think 
it while it is like I like there are moments in the book where it's like oh some of these it, they're almost like cartoonish melodrama moments <laughs> of like people reacting so intensely that you're like oh you feel that these characters are on the brink of madness yeah. right mm-hmm. and in the book they're a little more subdued i think specifically the wife whose name is not arlene <laughs> arlette arlette it makes sense that in the movie she seems more subdued because in the movie we are it is we're watching the events unfold whereas the book is supposed to be this dude's personal account mm-hmm. in his confession letter, right? And do we trust him? No. Exactly. <laughs> so everything we're hearing about her, how do we know any of that is true? Sure. He could very well ju- be just a piece of shit misogynist that hated his wife because mm-hmm. she dared disobey him. And is trying to make himself look better and like the victim in exactly. his writing of the story. Okay. I mean, right near the beginning of the book, there's this moment that I wish we got in some way in the movie where he writes down, am I going to get none of your sympathy? <laughs> yeah. No? Mm-mm. Okay. I love that <laughs> moment where it's like from the get-go, we're like, fuck no dude you are a a monster yeah insane he does try to get your sympathy which Mm -hmm. we'll talk about like several times he thinks he's writing this tragic story and you're gonna be like oh poor dude yeah (laughs) no notes there's a secondary part of the plot with the plot of land (laughs) and that is the hog farm Mm -hmm. because it's not just that Arlette wants to move to the city. It's that she wants to sell these hundred acres to a hog farm that even if they kept the farm and didn't go anywhere, their river would be polluted by hog guts and blood and it would ruin their land, essentially. So it becomes even more personal for Mm. Wilfred because of those stakes. Yeah, his justification for this is that he should be viewed as a hero for standing up against this big corporate interest hog farm i guess and then go slit your wife's throat like a hog but here's the yeah that's exactly (laughs) it i don't know a lot about old timey farming i'm not an old timey farm boy um (laughs) uh, every time he's describing like this future of they sell off this hundred acres to this hog farm it is, oh, our river, our, our stream will run red with blood and guts. Does that seem like an exaggeration? No. Because <laughs> uh, well, in my head, it's like it sounds so much like he's trying so hard oh, yeah. to justify this. That he's like, oh, I, I have. Whereas if he would have just been a fucking person and let his wife sell the 100 acres, at least he'd have his 80 acres and his home and like... It is all just this one man's pride is all it is. I do love that later on, like the last half of the book, uh, Mm -hmm. maybe it's even more than that, but he constantly or like reflects on how he made a mistake Mm -hmm. and how he should have just done what she wanted and like everything is worse than it could have been. And it it's just interesting the way it still fails to elicit any type mm-hmm. of sympathy from the <laughs> reader, or at least yeah, me. No. Yes. Like whatsoever. Well, it's because it's like I don't need it's like, oh you should I should feel something for you because you like see you regret and you know you made a mistake, but you're still so unapologetic it, about it in a way. It's, be- it's still poor me. Yeah. 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 It's because <laughs> the lesson he learns is murdering your wife is bad. <laughs> and the rest of us are like, no fucking shit, man. Yeah. And it's and you know it's <laughs> like only- the, you treat that like a revelation. <laughs> yeah. like, look, look, take it from me, guys. Killing your wife's not all it's cracked up to be. It will make you sad. <laughs> well, and you know that he only thinks it's bad because it didn't work out in his favor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because, because there are consequences to his actions. how, like, this not ideal woman and wife he felt she was, like, she clearly kept that house together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when, when they eventually start realizing the things that haven't been purchased. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Immediately after she's murdered, he has this thought of so many of the things in this house were hers. Mm-hmm. And it's like, yeah. A- anytime they go to clean stuff up, he's like, the stuff that she kept. Mm-hmm. And it's 
like, oh, you guys don't know what the fuck you're doing mm-hmm. because you didn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, in his pride, again, it takes the most reasonable solution. We talked a little bit about her, Arlette's idea for divorce. She, They've been fighting about this for, for months, mm-hmm. I feel like, in the book. And that discussion of let's sell the hundred acres split the money get divorced call it but the idea that she would take henry that would hurt the farm because then there wouldn't be a child to work the farm for again free for him. i think he just didn't want her to have e- either mm-hmm. way, it's, something it's the yeah. most because even in that most reasonable solution he would take whatever excuse mm-hmm. to turn it down mm-hmm. no matter what because i could see him like making a valid argument for like hey i want my son with me to help on the farm he loves it here but mm-hmm. he's so shitty that you're just like, yeah, right. <laughs> you mm-hmm. don't care about anyone, Wilf. And when he realizes <laughs> that there is no compromise, he starts working on Henry. The worst part of this dude is that he doesn't do any of the planning. It's the conniving man. Oh, fuck. I didn't even talk about the conniving man. Yeah. I hate this dude so much. <laughs> yeah, he sucks. He and, fucking sucks. Because it's part of his excuse for why he did this because he mm-hmm. he didn't really have a choice because deep inside all of us if you've got a penis i think just <laughs> it is implied yeah there's a conniving man and that's why his hatred was what drove him to resolve this even though mm-hmm. she was willing to compromise mm-hmm. he just wasn't willing to accept a compromise it was like you're gonna be with me or you're gonna be dead mm-hmm. and, <laughs> and he invents this other person that all of the bad things he does it's not him mm-hmm. it's the evil man that lives inside of him that makes all of his choices and performs all of his actions <laughs> <laughs> and what does the conniving man do, uh, tell henry to convince him this is uh, uh, the only solution. This is the part that makes you really hate him and never yeah. let go of that hate mm-hmm. because it's just so obvious, you know, as an adult reading it, how manipulative he mm-hmm. is with his son, just taking everything that Henry loves and cares about because Henry doesn't want to go. He wants to stay on the farm. Sure. And he he likes that life. And he has a girlfriend next door. Mm-hmm. And he's like, well, you know, you're going to have to move to the city. You're going to have to leave her. They're going to make fun of you because you're a country bumpkin. It's just going to be a really terrible and hard life. Yeah. And the only option is to get rid of her. And sometimes, what does he say? Sometimes when you want something, you just have to do the thing (laughs) that you want. Yeah, whatever. How easy, even if someone dies. Well, and Henry, wait, Henry, right? Yes. Yeah. Or Hank later (laughs) he henry was a really good boy you know quote Mm -hmm. unquote good boy like he went to church all the time he did his work he he was a little nerd yeah and (laughs) and he even uses his religion against Mm -hmm. him too because he's like well shannon shannon right girlfriend yeah shannon said when people die if they're not if they're like if they're in error yeah if they have sin then they're not going to go to heaven. And so he's telling his dad this, and his dad's like, well, actually, if we kill her, she doesn't have a chance to atone, so automatic pass into heaven. So murderers are really... We are getting her straight through the gates. (laughs) Yeah, we're doing her a favor. (laughs) Which leads us to the first point in the book where my brain invented a book that (laughs) did not happen. And in this particular case, kind of glad it didn't, (laughs) because... I had, there were a few points in this where I was inventing f- plot points in the future that were somehow worse than what actually oh, happened. Yeah. <laughs> because they have, they're out in the field, and he says, you know, when you kill someone, they go straight to heaven. And then in his narration in the book, he says, I regret this part so much. More than the act of killing my wife, I regret this because of what happened and mm-hmm. how Henry turned out. My uh, immediate, I went, oh no. I, my immediate thought was, they're going to kill the wife. Henry's going to go crazy. And he is going to take away that. Yeah. Like oh, a frailty when thing. I kill people. Yeah, frailty. <laughs> yes, it's he, frailty. I need oh, to watch frailty. You need to watch frailty, we need to watch man. frailty. And that would Ooh, be Bill like Paxton. his sweet one liner. Like, Hope it's You're going to heaven. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's 
very good. Yeah, that's what I fully expected to happen, that and then it been didn't. So cool, right? He becomes a serial killer. Uh, but uh, this is also a good point. I wanted to talk about Henry as a character, mm-hmm. and I want to know what you two feel about the actor who played him in the movie. Um, I thought I thought the actor who played him did a good job. Mm-hmm. Um, was there something you didn't like about him? Too old. That was the point okay. I yeah. wanted to make. I wasn't sure what it was that I couldn't quite like get into with him because he delivered his lines fine. Like he had emotion and stuff. He he was perfectly serviceable. Mm-hmm. Uh, really good at oh, crying God. on cue. He wasn't yeah. Will Wheaton. I can't. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah, you really wanted this really... to be played by Will Wheaton <laughs> and Jonathan Frakes, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I just wanted to Star Trek cast it. <laughs> uh, no, it's I. I think he's way too young and. Just like the wife, I think his I wanted his portrayal to be bigger. Mm. I mm-hmm. wanted his performance uh because we the way he I mean, faints on the way to the wells pretty that's great. really good faint, but in the book, we'll get to it. There's more I, tension with him in the book it, with what's possibly going to happen with him. You don't know how he's mm-hmm. going to handle this in the book, I felt throughout from the point where the deed happens on, I felt his the Hank is constantly on the verge of yes. completely falling apart. Yes. I thought that that the story was going to be about how, he, like, basically, don't have a moody teenager be an accomplice <laughs> to your career because it's not going to work mm-hmm. out. Yeah, I, I, I truly felt he was, like, in the book, maybe it's the way the audiobook is performed. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I don't know, but it is... I constantly felt he was on the verge of complete mental break speaking and that doesn't come through speaking of real quick i really appreciated in this instance reading i'm sorry listening to the audiobook Mm -hmm. because the arlette's you know arlette's voice is through wilf's Mm -hmm. writing Mm -hmm. so he can make her sound however he wants and he makes her sound insufferable Mm -hmm. (laughs) <laughs> like you, and that might be part of why I didn't read this one at all. I only listened to it. That might be part of why she seems mm-hmm. like such a different character too. Because I would not have read her in my head the way she's read in the audiobook. Which it, it's better the way that she's read in the audiobook because it makes more sense with That's, him writing yeah. it. So it's funny because I I read it, and the entire time I was reading her responses, I kept thinking that one of the reasons that I really love this story is it's a protagonist that every problem is their own recreation. Mm-hmm. And I love watching uh, a, a pride fall. It's it's great. And reading her responses to these statements and him being like, can you fucking believe this? I'm like, yeah, I, I love <laughs> I love that the words are reasonable and he will not accept them mm-hmm. as reasonable. And so I, I really enjoyed that. that. That's kind of a cool. I don't know. It just, it's, I mean, that's one of the great things about the differences of yeah. listening and reading. You get completely different experiences. Mm-hmm. So after we have Henry uh, accomplicing, mm-hmm. <laughs> he's, he's signed up. He he's resigns like, himself. You know what? Yeah. I guess we're going to murder mom. Young Don't love, know when. Man. Young love. <laughs> uh, they begin, well, the, before they begin the plan, Arlette lawyers up mm-hmm. because she says, you know what? I, I've had it. You're not going to get them from me. He offers to buy them. And she's like, with what fucking money? Mm -hmm. He's like, it might take me eight years to pay you back. Wait, he said eight, right? Eight or ten. Eight or ten. And then we're with him eight years later. And And he wishes he would have just done it. Right, And we know that he only could have gotten his hands on $750. Mm -hmm. Which I imagine for a hundred acres, the Farrington company was going to pay more. more. Mm -hmm. Also, Farrington, is that anything? Oh, we're in Hemingford home. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. We yeah. didn't even yeah. mention that. Yeah, we were last there in the stand. Yeah. So I, 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 Hemingford <laughs> and story and it. Yeah. Ben, ben Hanscom yeah. lives in it in his adulthood. <laughs> lives, lives in, in it. it. Yep. <laughs> lives in it. <laughs> Get inside in, it. <laughs> in my AO3 short story I'm writing, he does. Don't worry about it. <laughs> this is the argument that that blows it up because she says they'll pay me for all of it at once. And it's going to be uh, an insane amount more than you'll ever be able to do. You know, if you want to fight me over it, they will pay for a lawyer for me. So you know what? I'm going to lawyer up. And she does. 
And that is that's what puts the ticking clock on what has to happen next. Such a ticking clock that he makes the choice to do it like kind of right now, like in the middle of the mm, week. Yeah. And his, his son's <laughs> like, I don't think I can go to school week. tomorrow, dad. He's like, ah, shit. He's <laughs> Could have waited shit. till the weekend or the summer when he was it in is, math school. Yeah, his plan is so, and he keeps, as soon as it's done, he's like, oh, I didn't think this through at all. <laughs> Weird. There are so many things he's like, I thought this would work. I thought Because I hated her, her so. <laughs> she would die immediately and just nothing works out. Ugh. You know, I was wrong. Uh, I spoke too soon. Coming up is when we cross that bridge, that point of no return, because yeah. it, they do they play it a little differently in the movie, which I get for pace. Just do mm-hmm. the whole thing at once. Uh, but in the story, when Arlette gets the lawyer, says this is going to happen. Wilfred essentially tells Henry, all right, she we have to do it. Let's go. And Henry's first instinct is to run to his mom and beg her to just cancel everything. Just give up all this shit, quit all of it so we can be a family again. And Arlette slaps him across the face and admonishes him for, uh, says, "You, your father has infected you with his cowardice and greed. Do you think that really happened? I do. Okay. Because I think well, I guess movie, for Henry movie version too. Arlette is a normal human who gets blown up. I do believe that there is an extreme given how we see her act when she's drunk. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. We know that she has that in her. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I do kind of believe it. And I also believe they've been having this fight for months mm-hmm. and she's at her she's wits. Did, end. Yeah. She, she didn't make a great decision. Uh, yeah. I, I just like questioning everything he reports to us. Cause it's, I mean, that's part <laughs> oh, of it. Yeah, like absolutely. he's so unreliable. It's like, well, but is it true? She gets real gross in two different ways like the Mm. book version and the movie version different both Mm. equally as oh (laughs) yeah so let's get to that scene basically what happens is they we're gonna do the killing we're gonna pull a trick on her we're gonna get her hammered by saying henry convinced me uh we're gonna sell everything we're gonna move Mm -hmm. and so they open a few bottles of wine Mm. which is also fucking despicable Mm -hmm. like he tells us uh, in the narration that she has a bit of a drinking. She's one of the one of those people who can't have two drinks without having four. Yes. But she knows that. So but she, she knows that. Always stops. Exactly. Yeah. So in the scene, they get her hammered and then she is weirdly inappropriate around their son. Mm-hmm. And Wilford is like, oh, can you fucking believe it? Poor, 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 I, poor, poor. I, <laughs> I fucking believe. forcibly got her drunk and then acted like her reaction to that is this mm-hmm. more where they are basically roofing, roofing her with just like getting her as drunk as possible. It is gross. I also I prefer the way the book does it as opposed to the movie, because in the movie, it just hard cuts to she's mm-hmm. hammered, half kissing her son, like just very too close. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But. What I appreciated in the story is that that getting her drunk happens completely away. And then she's the one who just, you know, says, bring the boy out so we can celebrate. And he's like, oh, yeah, let's do that. <laughs> and the, that whole point, it's mm-hmm. he is ready to make a display of it. It is. Yeah, it it's is even so more maniacal. Yeah, it is him pulling the strings mm-hmm. the entire time. Yep. And. <laughs> The, yeah, Sam, no, how do you feel I'm about sorry, just Would too, you like to talk about mom drunk? Sure. <laughs> God, it's better coming uh, it, from me. <laughs> yeah, it's not good. Yeah. It, it's just so gross to manipulate. Like, he knows, mm-hmm. you know, he's a kid. He's going to be more reactionary. And so when he sees his mom in the state, yeah, there's a great done. line right. where he says, uh, teenagers, for as much as they rebel, they're either, how did, I forget how he says it. He's like, teenagers, they're always uh, rebelling, or uh, when they're not, they're as stiff as statues. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it is a cool one. So she decides to give him the birds and the bees talk. Kind of. Now. <laughs> and well, she does it with some, like, gesturing visual and aids visual aids Ugh. using her own body which yeah, actually i feel great. like i'm making it sound worse like. than what actually happened she's just like drunk and kind of lewd and crude about mm-hmm. like make sure you don't 
put it in her and make a baby she's like touching her crotch almost rub rub, rub your dick here 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 and here here. but not in here (laughs) like it's another example of the book being way bigger because in the movie it is still gross she is still very inappropriate but it's more on the level of just like uh, a woman is acknowledging sexuality, kind of, <laughs> and now she has to die. Uh, it's the whereas, 20s, Ben. <laughs> whereas in the book, it is like, oh, yeah, you shouldn't be touching yourself. Oh, no, you no, need no. to stop that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and this whole ordeal puts Henry over the edge. Mm. He leaves the porch sobbing and runs to his room. And no one likes to see their parents yeah. nearly have sex yeah. with themselves oh, or each right. other. <laughs> and uh, she passes out. And Wilfred goes to get the knife. And here we have a very important discussion between Henry and Wilfred. Because he asks, does it have to be a knife? Can it just be a pillow? This is so So, weird that this isn't part of the book going forward. (laughs) Because Wilfred, like, this is, like, he's into it. He's into the murder. Because it's a knife. Like, think about a knife, Mm -hmm. how much more personal that is. You're, you're. Putting something and he doesn't want there to be someone. a lot. As you said during the movie, can't we do it with a pillow? Not phallic enough, son. <laughs> I can't put the pillow inside of her. <laughs> Not with that attitude. Yeah, it's he says like he when he has been fantasizing about this. Uh oh. Uh-huh. Uh, he had always pictured the knife, and so the knife it will be. Here's an interesting thing. They use voiceover in the movie Mm -hmm. because he's writing the confession Mm -hmm. and they pick very specific points to use it. I feel like this would have been a great one because that scene where he's Mm -hmm. explaining, I mean, it doesn't need it because the way Tom Jane is holding that knife when he explains the reasons that this is the most merciful way. It was very sexy. It was very (laughs) sexy in a haunting way. (laughs) Like it was very, you could read it on his Mm -hmm. face. We didn't, I guess, need it. It'd be a little handholdy, but I just, I really like that he knows it has to be this because it's the way I always dreamed it would be Mm -hmm. because that's what it it equates to. It's so gross. It is so gross. Uh, And and then we get to it and we've been talking for 40 minutes. (laughs) We are we even 30 got... pages into the yeah. book. Uh, this There's happens. There's a lot of family history to set up. Yeah. 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 And then the scene comes and it happens so fast. Because mm-hmm. uh, Henry says, "I if I have to look, I don't think I can do it. Like, I think there's a way you don't have to look. They get a burlap sack. Henry holds it over her head. And uh, Wilfred goes in with the knife and immediately fucks it up. Is he slashes at her and immediately she's up and flailing and screaming. And Henry, and this is the point where I was like, okay, the actor playing Henry, he's fine. But this scene is not how I pictured this Mm -hmm. because Henry ends this scene catatonic in a corner. Mm -hmm. Like Mm -hmm. he is immediately terrified and of no help. Yeah. He, he faints partway through, and then when he when Will looks over, he, that's when he's like in the corner. So he's yeah. Mm-hmm. It it's a very violent murder. It's awful for your son to be watching and participating in passively. Yeah, and and the the movie. Uh, I think we had a simultaneous reaction, CM. Yeah, because in the movie they shove the bag over her head, and she starts flailing, and it cuts for the first time back. <laughs> to Thomas Jane in the hotel room writing his confession. And I had just enough time to go, thank you, movie, (laughs) for not showing the brutal... And then it cuts back and they're both covered in blood. And you're like, oh. Well, you know, there uh, were a couple... That almost showed restraint. There were a couple things they didn't show that I was like, I'm relieved because I it was hard to listen to. Mm -hmm. But man, you really pulled back. And then they just like... Fuck you with the things they do show. Yeah, mm-hmm. the I like that we didn't get to see uh, that he slices her throat five times mm-hmm. before she finally dies, and you don't see that in the movie. But I do like you, that see, you can a couple, see the cuts. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You can see so much of the damage. They don't show you the damage being inflicted, but they'll show you all the aftermath. What they also don't show is 
maybe one of my favorite things about the story, that something that added a lot, I think, and really, really fucked me up, is that after it is done, they start to clean up. There's more blood than anyone expected. <laughs> and so they're struggling and trying to wrap her up and get as little splash as possible. And they take her out to the dooryard. And as Wilfred is carrying her to the well, he feels her move. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this is not in the movie at all, but it is one of the biggest like moments that it, it horrified me mm. because after all of it is done, he is obsessing over did she move or not? Because the things that they do while they're cleaning up, the thought that she lived through them mm-hmm. is one of the worst things. Yeah. I, it's the scariest thing. It, he's not as haunted in the movie mm-hmm. by her death, seemingly. And maybe that's just because we're not getting as much of that internal dialogue. But he's in the book. He's never the same after this. No. And mm. kind of crazy. Yup. Yeah. Thomas Jane's good. Yeah. Too hot. Not too, yeah. Hot people don't know how to be crazy. <laughs> I don't think that's true. My dog, I, think, well, I, I, I think they know how to be crazy. We just don't know how to recognize it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really like that. Uh, first of all, I like that Henry faints before mm-hmm. she yeah. goes in the well. We did laugh because really there's a moment of it's levity good that we needed. Fall. It is. Yeah. The moment in that comes next, he uh, takes and there's also it's also different in the movie. The well is built up, where in the book it is a in the ground. It's mm-hmm. there's wooden stakes around it, so mm-hmm. nobody walks over it and steps on it. And he throws her down. And he, when he hears the thud and he goes, not as deep as I thought it was. Not as much water. As much water. Yeah, as he the, yeah. wanted her to be mm-hmm. like covered. Submerged. Mm-hmm. And I, I love the time. I don't love it. That he spends at the well, like with her and, and throwing her various items in, you know, because he's got to make it look like she ran away. So all those things are going to the well, including the bloody mattress. Don't make fun, <laughs> make fun <laughs> for this. <laughs> Which... Uh, in the 1920s is not as <laughs> stiff and robust a mattress as... It's not a Casper mattress. Is <laughs> yeah. what you were... He threw his Casper right in that well. That's well, it good came money. in that tiny box. <laughs> I thought I could roll it up the same way. This podcast not brought to you by Spring <laughs> Casper. Get at us. Send me free pillows. <laughs> I have no idea what I was saying. I'm so sorry. Oh, okay. He's oh, no. throwing stuff in the well. Yeah, I, I love how much time he spends at it mm-hmm. in that horror kind of, like with Dolores Claiborne mm-hmm. and just the horror of what's in the well and like the imaginings of that. I wish we had gotten a little more of that in the movie. It's played yeah. very straight. Yeah, because he the keeps movie, yeah. looking down the well and seeing, thinking he sees her move. Does he? Did, mm-hmm. did she? Is she in a different position now than she did? Is her mouth moving? No, it's just a rat. It's just a rat back it, in that uh, ass up. It, <laughs> in the movie. <laughs> that's, in the book, yeah. Oh, God, it comes out right. tail first out of her mouth. Oh, boy. But what did you guys think about what he about about the alibi the cover story that 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 she she ran ran away away and and what he packs to sell Mm -hmm. the story he's a good liar yes like in the movie especially it's it's, funny i don't know about in the book you said that because uh, you know as time goes by uh we get a scene where her lawyer shows up the next day looking Mm -hmm. for her and he is like, nah, she ran off and the lawyer's instantly suspicious (laughs) and then the next day the sheriff comes Mm -hmm. The sheriff is obviously like, hmm, very obvious, like, this doesn't add (laughs) up. And it's funny that you say he's a good liar, because when I was reading it, I thought, oh, he's trying way too hard. Well, I thought that when I was listening to it, but Mm -hmm. in the movie, it's a scene when they're in the bedroom, and the sheriff looks under the bed, and he's like, oh, these would be good shoes for her to walk in if you say she walked Mm -hmm. out of here and down the road instead of taking the truck. And he was like... Oh, yeah, she took her canvas shoes. Yeah, canvas like, he shoes seemed totally cool. But he yeah, a, in the book. In the book, he's like over explaining <laughs> everything. He has an explanation for everything yeah. to the point where. He embellishes where, too much. Mm-hmm. He adds more than what is being asked. And then yeah. as yes. the sheriff's leaving, because he's like, oh, it's I'd, a 20s, worked, out, I'd so. worked out a plan with Henry to do a signal on whether or not we should like tell this. And then <laughs> as the, the sheriff's like already leaving, he's done. And he's like, you should come look at the well. 
it's great and fine and nothing's weird we're, about it. We're filling in the well, but you need I need you to know we're not filling in the well for a bad reason. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's Oh, it's, can we It's so, a great reason. Can we talk about why he's filling in the well because Why are we filling in the well? I had to take a break from listening to this book during this scene. Mm-hmm. Does he do the voice? No, it's just no. <laughs> That's the one. Yeah, that's the one. The cow, cow screaming voice. in pain. Yeah. yeah. So he lures a cow onto the cap of the well and the cow falls in. And it's, again, this is like, we didn't spend as much time at the well. It happens mm-hmm. very quickly in the movie, which I'm grateful for. But in the book, mm-hmm. it's that cow suffers. Yeah. And it crushes part of Arlette's face. It yeah, it hicks her yeah. in the face. Yeah, it does. His Because the idea, I guess, is to just cover her with a cow. <laughs> <laughs> And it a mattress didn't work. Yeah, the mattress like didn't cover her. So I assumed the plan was the cow was just to co- finish covering her. <laughs> and then you he know. drops a cow on her and it just makes it so much worse. <laughs> yes, you guys. And then Henry, does this well, point where so Henry sees? It's, yeah, Henry's freaking out because the cow is like screaming in the well. It obviously broke its legs and when it landed. And it's a cow that Henry is mm-hmm. affectionate towards. Yeah, and Arlette was too. Mm-hmm. It was more of a pet at this point than mm-hmm. a cow. He makes a comment like, I should have butchered this cow. It had stopped producing milk. Yeah, years yeah. ago, but it was more of a pet. But I had to take a break from listening for three days. Mm-hmm. And I didn't even finish this section, so when <laughs> I started to listen again, I was still with the cow in the well. <laughs> and I finished that part, and then I had to take another three-day break. <laughs> It's it sucks, but I it, it did make me laugh. <laughs> this is this is a Ben moment where That's I was fine. like, <laughs> uh, because he does this thing, and it is obviously it was such a stupid plan from the outset. Like, what are mm-hmm. you doing? But it works so horribly, and it sets Hank off on this. Like he he says, like I can hear madness. Like right, mm-hmm. he he could go crazy at anytime and for whatever reason i'm like i envisioned him looking down the well and being like what other awful thing can i have my son suffer through (laughs) yeah son this this is not great go get a donkey we gotta drop that down there now (laughs) and this was the second book my brain invented was it becoming him just dropping progressively bigger things his car the sheriff I thought this scene was going to end with him being like, come see the well, Sheriff. Shove. <laughs> oh, no, oh. Hank, don't look down there. The sheriff's dead. <laughs> for, for a minute, I thought Henry was going to shove the sheriff in the well. I did, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was really like, thought so, too. And I was, I, I, uh, at a certain point, I was like, someones they're going to shove someone down the well before the end of this book. And nope. that person's going to just climb back up because it's... Full. Yeah. Like, just shit. There's like eight cows like down eight there. Farm animals here. I only didn't think that because the book makes it very obvious that that's not going to happen. Yeah. Because the sheriff, part of the reason Wilfred gets away with this is because the sheriff has the mindset of, you know, she ran away, mm-hmm. probably best, because seems like she wasn't minding you anyway. And it's really your business, mm-hmm. not mm-hmm. mine or anybody else's. You know, he isn't really. This is another, Care. yeah, this is another <laughs> angle that I thought the book was going to do more with was the fact that Wilfred is now, he has destroyed his family, he's destroyed his son, he has damned himself, and I expected there to be more with the theme of he's done this horrible thing, it has destroyed his life, and society continues to refuse to punish him. He's done this awful thing. But because of how society is in 1922, no one cares. Yeah, the, all of his punishment is his own madness and mm-hmm. what he, the way he manipulated his son, you know, how that destroyed their relationship. Because Henry, I mentioned earlier, he's really religious because it's about this part where he's struggling with what they did. Mm-hmm. And his dad, you know, tells him he loves him. And he's like, you know, I know, even though I don't deserve it. And he tells his dad that he can't pray anymore because mm-hmm. he, he fears that God would strike him dead. Yeah. I don't know. I, I expected after, because when the sheriff is like, 
listen, he's you are expecting the sheriff to be like, I know what's up. Because it describes him as being sharp. Yeah. Yeah. He even he sends Henry away and then his demeanor changes and you expect him to be like, I know something happened here. But instead, he's just like, listen. Your wife sounded awful, and she's gone now. <laughs> well, so. it's, it's a cool way to show the society in that time mm-hmm, exactly. because you're, you're like, oh, shit, he's yeah. in trouble because he is sharp. And if mm-hmm. he didn't have that mindset, he probably would have, like, suspected yeah. Wilfred. Which, which is cool. Leads, yeah. yeah, it's really great, but I, I expected it. I mean, it plays mm-hmm. back into my first what I first <laughs> thought the book was about because I thought it was going to be Henry learning, oh, we did this horrible thing, but I sent her to heaven. And the law doesn't care. Mm -hmm. So I... You just wanted a a Dexter set in the 20s. (laughs) I did. I did. That's exactly what I wanted. See, I think the movie does make it very much uh, bitches be crazy. (laughs) But the, the thing that I appreciate about the book is that the underlying instance here is that, you know, the, the lawyers come and gone... We've had that interaction. There is another layer to the plan where Wilfred tells Henry to tell Shannon Mm -hmm. about the night that Arlette slapped him Mm -hmm. and to maybe tell the facts of that story a little differently Mm -hmm. and then be sure to tell her not to say anything, especially not to her parents. For a man who doesn't care about town gossip, he sure knows how to use it. Mm. Exactly. Fucking A, he does. (laughs) So that when the sheriff goes out, because he went to talk to that family first, he had to kind of pull the story out of Shannon, so he had to fight for the information. Mm-hmm. So as far like that, that story is already set. And then he had to like success. drag it out of her, makes it seem more believable because exactly. mm-hmm. it's like she's so reluctant. Well, and that's, and that's what like she that, thinks happened. That's too. that masterminding yeah. that he has. And in the book, it does so much more work. In regards to mm-hmm. how he's laying out the story, well, because you for don't people to see yeah. all the pieces fall into place until they're actually happening. Mm-hmm. Like, because you, it doesn't show us that conversation. Right. It's just like he's, you know, off to do the thing we discussed, and then you're like, "But what is it?" <laughs> and then you find out as the sheriff gives you that information, which is cool too. So this is another small thing that the movie changes, which it, when the sheriff leaves, they talk about the well being half filled in because of a dead cow. And he's like, nope, I don't need to see it. I got shit to do. And Henry thinks, he just says, he didn't even want to look. And then cuts. But in the book, Mm -hmm. I love that they go like, all right, well, let's go fill in the well then. And they get back and a rat has crawled out with a bloody piece of Arlette's burlap sack that was over her head. And he throws his shovel into the well and splits it another layer. Mm-hmm. Shovel on top of a cow, mm-hmm. on top of a rat, on top of a woman. This book a is a lot about putting things in holes. Yes, exactly. Or not putting them in <laughs> holes. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I don't know. So they bury, they fill in the well, put some rocks on top of it, and the rest of the summer's good. The The crops are nice. The lawyer came out a few more times, but they had, didn't have anything to prove anything, so they sent him on his way. Shannon and gets laid. <laughs> what? Wait, Hank gets Hank, laid. Hank gets laid a bunch, probably. Uh, uh, nothing Shannon, like a sad boy. Here's, <laughs> <laughs> here's something that's interesting because I thought it was just creepy, and then it turns out there's a oh, point. Oh, I- yeah. Is this the scene between Shannon and? Yeah. yeah. I thought he was gonna. Oh my bang god! Her. I thought yeah. so too. Oh, we like, all thought it was so gross. I can't even. Yeah. I am <laughs> so, fully... so angry about something that didn't happen. So m- <laughs> months have passed. <laughs> Arlette is gone. Everybody in town assume have they've all bought into she ran off. That's kind of the the mm-hmm. company line now. Shannon has been coming over and cooking meals and helping clean. And she's got nice hips. And yeah, and yeah, and Wilfred's Wilfred starting is to, weird about starting it. to notice as she's washing dishes that like them, them hips be popping. Yeah, and like, like she's like, she's getting boobies. She washes like, dishes like a woman. Yeah, like she like. <laughs> <laughs> and and it sets um. An uncomfortable stage that we all thought something else was going to happen. Yeah. At the point when he is like, well, if I was his age, I'd be, uh, I'd, I'd well, be sparking you too. Well, when he was his age, he sparked <laughs> our life. Yeah. Well, that's it's the, creepy. It's it super creepy. 
Well, because he it, it gives you that impression it's going to go that way because she's talking about him. She, he's so distant. I have to call his name two or three times to get his attention sometimes. And he, she's having kind of an adult woman conversation yes. <laughs> with his dad because mm-hmm. you, and kids at this age should be hiding that they even mm-hmm. know the other mm-hmm. exists. Yeah. Well, the the fact, just the fact that he's like. Well, we're friends too, fourteen-year-old no. girl, uh-uh. and I'm like, mm-mm, mm-mm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but as we're gonna soon come to find out, uh, she's getting curvier because she's with child. Mm-hmm. And I didn't even like thinking back make that connection because yeah. I was so <laughs> so <laughs> sure it was gross. Ready yeah. to be even yeah. more <laughs> creeped out by this guy. <laughs> now let's jump to a night in August. Everyone's in bed until there's some screaming is heard from the barn. Wilford runs out to check on his cows. What does he find? He finds rats chewing the udder off of one of his cows. The visual in the movie. Ben, I you looked away it. at the right time. I was looking away and I missed it, which is too and bad. I did not rewind it. I, <laughs> I, I, couldn't. I love this scene in the book because it's so wild. It's insane. It is his, this is what I was talking about, where people overreact to stuff in the story. It is such a like gothic horror reaction to because he yeah. comes out and a one of the teats on his cow has been mutilated and he reacts so over just vomiting and like doubling over it's it is like well, it he is, thinks of the rats as our lets yes yeah he so is this around the point what when is it this that, is the same rat the, oh yeah this is the point where he's mm-hmm. like well this is the rat that had the burlap sack i yeah. know i know it was and it doesn't have any distinctive markings he just knows i just know um, it's also and, the size of a cat which is not in the movie. Yeah. The yeah. rats get progressively larger. I wish they'd done that in the yeah. movie. It's hard to find dog yeah. sized rats, though. <laughs> it, what part is it where Hank yells, She has the rats now? The rats are hers. Because <laughs> there's a point where, because this is what I'm talking about. Henry has these moments where he, like, kind of temporarily becomes disconnected mm-hmm. from reality. Oh, it's after Shannon's sent away. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. They, yeah. they see rats, and he's like, as he's like flipping out about all this stuff. Yeah, he stuff. gets a little hysterical. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, now we get to the reveal. We discussed earlier that the Cotteries are a more well off family. They mm-hmm. have more land, they have indoor plumbing. And that indoor plumbing turns out is very important because Shannon was taking a shower, and her mom walked in and noticed that belly. And that's the reveal that she is pregnant. Very pregnant. Very. She's a five, five months. Five months, yeah. And uh, it's this also this scene did not go the way I thought it was because the it becomes kind of a game of telephone as it gets through the town Mm -hmm. kind of like that. She's gone because she doesn't show up to school. Hank slash Henry goes to the house. We find out that uh, they sent her away and they have this conversation where Henry is basically saying I could marry her and start a family. Basically what exactly you did with mom like we could do this. Uh, if mom were here, she would have fixed this. We would have had this money. We would have solved all these problems had mom been here and lays it, just lays mm-hmm. it all out there. And Wilfred's reaction, first of all, it is correct in that, like, if you think your mom would have fixed this, yeah, you yeah. forgot your mom already. But also the fact that he, I didn't expect him to say, yeah, there's no fucking way I'm letting you marry that girl. I expected he would have been on the same path he'd been on. Well, I, I also was surprised, but I think I have an answer for this with how supportive he was of like, you got her pregnant. You're not the first teenagers to get knocked mm-hmm. up and you're certainly not going to be the last. He was and I, I was impressed for a second because it's like, wow, for someone, especially during this time to have such a like chill kind of progressive, really mm. viewpoint on this pregnancy. I didn't expect that from him. And then I was like, well, I guess he's got to be really kind to his son since he's his accomplice. <laughs> like Pisses him off. He goes to the sheriff. So I again, it was like that unreliable narrator thing. I wasn't sure if. If he 
you know, if this just was something he was like, yeah, you know, this fits into what I did and I support you and whatever you guys want to do, except don't think that a five month pregnant woman who now has to think about and care for a baby is going to run off with you not Mm -hmm. knowing what her, you know, what is in store for their future. She's got to protect her chap. Her chap. Chap. I, I, that word is ruined from, you know, later books we'll get to. (laughs) So we find out that Shannon has been sent to a school, or not a school, a a church, basically. Mm -hmm. A religious prison. (laughs) Yeah, where they will take care of her for the next few months. She'll continue school. She's super smart. Adoption. Yeah. Oh, can I just say real quick during the conversation between the two dads, who Mm -hmm. Wilfred is always described as like, this guy's my friend. Again, I wondered if he just thinks that or if Mm. this guy always kind of like looked down on them because they're very clearly less well off than them. And he goes on about how intelligent his daughter is and how she was going to be something and she's still going to be something. And I just read into this exchange, like kind of some pity and disdain from Mm -hmm. Shannon's dad towards him. Like, yeah, I'm not going to let my daughter marry your son. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I see that. My argument with that is I feel like that would have been something he would have put the stop to when he knew they were going together. Because they they spend all mm. summer dating because they, they walk on the road back and forth between their house. Like, everybody knows that. If he didn't it's, approve, I, I feel like. Well, I, I thought about that, but I attributed it to his pride because he ta- they talk a lot about how she dresses like modest head to toe covered and, mm-hmm. and that's part of the reason they didn't catch on that she was mm-hmm. pregnant for five months because she's always dressed in baggy clothing so i thought mm-hmm. maybe the dad just could not fathom his daughter getting freaky yeah. <laughs> also before we move on his neighbor played by neil mcdonough in a slight waste of Neil McDonough. Uh, uh, He's fine, man. but well, it just Neil McDonough you, is so fucking cool. It makes he's you the realize only person without an accent. That that's that guy. Yeah. And it's too that's that guy for me to get into it. <laughs> that's fair. That's yeah. Oh, see, I just I, with Tom Jane that ac- their accents in the scene together. I hated that scene. Yeah. Because it just it didn't didn't with mesh. The very first scene when. Thomas Jane started talking. I was like, ooh, he's really going for this accent, huh? Almost immediately, I'm like, nah, he's nailing it. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Actually, actually, yeah. He this changed. is how this character Once your sounds. ears settle into it, it feels natural. I knew it was Tom Jane, and I was like, hey, there's Tom Jane. And then I kind of looked harder, and I was like, is that Tom <laughs> Jane? He looks so much different. It's yeah. just the way he holds himself. His facial expressions mm-hmm. are different. I like it. So they end this father-father chat uh, because Harlan has come over to the house to have a discussion. And he says, this whole thing's going to set me back a shitload of money because after she's done here, I'm still sending her to a normal school that is now letting women go. Mm -hmm. But no, no girls have graduated. My daughter's going to be the first to graduate from this school. And so she's going here. It's three hundred dollars. I need you to pay. Look, I know you can't rustle up half of that but you can get 75 together for the tutor. And I know you can because I know you own this whole place free and clear. Am I weird or is like the, her dad's response, like what he wants from him, what he's mm-hmm. demanding. Isn't that pretty reasonable? So fucking reasonable. <laughs> mm-hmm. So and he even says uh, the $75 compared to your son spending the next 15 <clears throat> years changing diapers. I think you're getting off light. I also like that. He's like, if you pay it, you pay it. If you don't, we're done. I mean, they're already mm-hmm. done, but He's like, I'll have absolutely no respect for you if you don't pay it. Mm -hmm. So it's up to you. And it's established earlier that it's farm community. Everybody helps each other. If your equipment's broken down, you can borrow someone else's equipment. There are certain pieces that make their way around every farm. He gave him a break on some equipment when Arlette left. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Only charged him like twenty bucks or Mm -hmm. something. And so this is basically saying, if you don't do it, because I know you can, so don't say you can't. We're not Dude. neighbors anymore. Yeah. Not friends, because I still think they were never friends, but they're mm. not going to be neighbors. Yeah. And uh, and thus, uh, we start the downward trajectory, uh, because <laughs> Wilfred thinks, hey, I told everybody that she had a stash of cash. What if she has a stash of cash? I thought that this was going <laughs> to be like a... Edgar Allan Poe style, he just goes crazy in the house looking for mm. the cash was going to be the telltale heart, basically. Yep. No, I, there is cash. <laughs> I thought he was legit going to stumble on a like 
getaway bag and shit. Like, <laughs> I like that she actually had considered it. This led to my favorite part of the entire audiobook, in which he says, after searching, I found two hat boxes. In the first one, I found a hat. <laughs> and I had to pause it because I laughed so hard. <laughs> the the matter of fatness of it. I'm like, well, mystery solved. <sighs> what do you find in the other one, Ben? Uh, he found, what it was it, 70? 40. Oh, yeah. $40. Not enough. What no. a bitch. Yeah. She couldn't leave him 75 <laughs> His His reasoning, because he finds it and he's like, damn it. Yeah. <laughs> what? This awful woman. Nothing, none of the other bad things in my life that happened from this point on would have ever happened if I would have just found $75. I, if that bitch could have His logic, it wasn't until we were watching the movie and you explained yeah. what his logic was yeah. that I even got <laughs> why he I was like what are you talking about because his logic is that because he needs another couple dollars he goes to the bank and the bank says you want $30 no way you want $700 take a mortgage We'll give it to you. Come on. And that's his reasoning is that if he would have just found $75, the bank wouldn't have told him he could take a mortgage. Nope. He never would have found out he could have gotten $750. What Neil McDonough (laughs) says of like, you are incapable of taking responsibility for everything. A hundred percent. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's I hate him. (laughs) <laughs> he it's a hard story to read because mm-hmm. uh, he just sucks it's i i don't know there is something i enjoyable about reading a character oh, yeah. if so sure. hard yeah. headed yeah that as the reader you're like man everything's out uh, there for you you are who <laughs> king is writing to I, yeah, this in this story <laughs> this one is dedicated to me uh but while in the bank henry steals his car I love this. I thought this it was great. cool because he has two vehicles and he's like, I honestly, I did not notice because I so often take either one that mm. when I came out of the bank and my, I can't remember which the vehicle. Tea. The T is what he left. The tr- He took the truck because it's mm. more reliable. Yeah. Mm. So he gets in his car and he's just driving along and then he's like. Wait, a, Wait second. a minute. This isn't what I drove in. I like the part. There's a note on the seat, CM. <laughs> yeah. It's not yeah. that bad. <laughs> I, I love when he's in <laughs> the bank, he hears a car start yeah. up. Yeah. He hears a car drive up, stop, another car start and drive away. I and he's like, huh, I wonder if this what that was my kid stealing my car. <laughs> I listened for it in the movie. I didn't catch anything. I was yeah, hoping I for like a so. loud engine start. I thought that would have been great. Yeah. But the note that is on the seat says, Dad, you know what I did and you know what I'm doing. Don't say shit or I'll tell everyone everything. Love That's all you need to son. say. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and this is when he's he signs it Hank and mm-hmm. he's told his dad he wants to be called Hank now. Yeah, because Zarlette hated that name. Mm-hmm. It's like he's punishing himself. He won't go by the name that she loved. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, this is we skip out on pretty much all of the sheriff after Henry leaves relationship with Wilfred in the movie. So w- when the sheriff comes back to discuss uh, Henry being gone and a robbery that happened near where the truck was found, conveniently <laughs> enough, mm-hmm. they don't do this in the movie, but they do it in the book, and I really liked it. As the sheriff is talking, the conniving man puts together a story to explain why he didn't reach out to the police, because that's obviously a giant question. Why wouldn't you say your kid left to mm-hmm. go uh Kidnap a pregnant woman. (laughs) And his answer is, he's been in contact with his mom. I don't think he's going where you think he's going. I actually loved this, Mm -hmm. too, because it's just like, oh, enough that I think it would throw you off. Yeah, and the fact that it does completely throw... The sheriff was like, well, shit, I thought I had everything figured out. (laughs) Fuck. Uh, Okay. Yeah, that all makes sense. Well, it works because he buys, he picks up the groceries from the store and that's where they get their mail. So he's like, yeah, Mm -hmm. I I bet she sent him a telegram. He got it when he was picking up supplies. No way to check that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) Mm-hmm. And uh, he's, he says, you know, my son's not a thief. He, you don't have any information that he wasn't wearing cowboy clothes because he says he was wearing cowboy style clothes during the robbery and sends the sheriff on his way. And that day he sits down to try to read a book, which it's it's talked a lot about yeah. how well read he is. 
That's a weird bit that yeah. like Well, it's it's interesting cuz it's used to show his disdain for other people mm-hmm. for mispronouncing words. Mm-hmm. Well, and it shows him like he's a storyteller. His yeah. lies his lies are fabricating these stories. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it is interesting because yeah, he he hates city people because the city is for fools mm-hmm. and He's learned, and but people think he's a bumpkin because he likes living off the land, and it's all so fucking insecure. Yes. Well, he's when, such yeah, a when, loser. When mm. her dad comes over and they're having that conversation, he's explaining she's going to go to school. He's like, she's so good at trigonometry, yeah, trigonometry or whatever. Tri- yeah, whatever. And he's like, in his head, he's like, you idiot, you fucking, fucking dumb cuck. shit. <laughs> <laughs> How could you be successful when I struggle so much when you're stupid and I like books? It, it's so, <laughs> it, he's such an insecure dork. He sucks. So he sits down to read a book and then uh, Arlette boops him on the nose. I, that is yeah. how it's described. Yeah. yeah. So I, I like the change in the movie mm-hmm. way, way better. Oh, really? Yeah. That he's sitting reading the book and a drop of what looks like blood falls on the pages. Because <laughs> yeah. cool. the roof is leaking. He he is reading and he senses Arlette reaching her hand from behind him. It reminded me about the end of Pet Cemetery, mm-hmm. But she pokes him on the nose and he's talking about the her cold, dead fingertip on his nose. And then she's tapping his head mm-hmm. and he gets up and he sees that the there's a leak. Mm-hmm. A storm has come. Man, and I boy, love Pet cemetery, cemetery. Can we talk about nope. that again sometime? We're going hey, to. you know what? Huh. That's a great idea. <laughs> because our Patreon selection, Tony Horstman, also got to be the first person to pick a Whoa. Dairy Public Radio Revisited. Who knew that that's coming that's up? That's great. And she selected Pet Cemetery. Smooth, what, are, what could smooth, possibly? You guys. So listeners... Wow! If you, if you want to know how we feel about Pet Cemetery, it's coming up again soon. Or so. another book we haven't read in a while. You should pay money, and we'll do that. <laughs> just, just We're, a thought. Okay. Anyway, back have, to the story. No, you have to explain what revisited means. We're plugging this for, mid if, episode. If, 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 this, this I did not mean for this to go on this, <laughs> this long. Mid episode Patreon plug. If you sign up at the hundred dollar tier, you get to pick oh, our do next it gross. book. That. <laughs> Is that not, how's that you're doing gr- it so pitchy. <laughs> That's how you've met me, right? Oh, you've no. been to pitches with me. Sign up for a hundred dollars, <laughs> and you can pick our next book. And not only do you get to pick our next book, that book jumps to the head of the line, and you get to pick a second book. That second book is a Dairy Public Radio revisited. You can select any book we have already covered, and we will reread that book and do a one episode recap and how that book has changed for us since we covered it last time and if it's if we've got different feelings and we're gonna find out if that's gonna be worth paying for or not soon <laughs> <laughs> fuck we're good at business we're so good at business congratulations <laughs> tony <laughs> all right <laughs> where to the we? book all right so the roof is leaking good thing I can, good thing that bitch didn't have $35 because now I know I can go to the bank. Mm-hmm. And so he decides, I'm going to take out the mortgage. I'm, I'm going to keep myself busy because the several farm animals had died also. Mm-hmm. And so he didn't have the manpower to do some of the work. Uh, he didn't have enough animals to take care of all the time. So he just, he's also day, going crazy. He's also he going insane. Sh- instead of getting a mortgage, he should have sold it because yes. he already mm-hmm. has lost everything. Yes. Yeah. This is the point where he's like, he recognizes that even mm-hmm. he's like, hey, if I were smart, I would just call it uh, quits. But he, he keeps like, I didn't murder her for nothing. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. This is my home. <laughs> God damn it. I worked so hard to keep this. I'm not leaving unless it's in handcuffs. The uh, the alternate title for this was sunk cost fallacy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so he gets the mortgage and he takes two hundred dollars home with him. Besides, he's gonna hide it in that hat box. Ben, what does he find in that hat box? A hat. <laughs> nice. <laughs> what does he find in the other one? A rat. Oh, they rhyme. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> this this scene, he brings the money home. He takes a bath. He heats up all the water, and he is stark ass naked in his house. We didn't get that in the. Movie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only upset because it would have been Tom Jane. Right, you just realized that you're angry about it. Yeah. Now. yeah. And he reaches his hand up to hide the money, and he is bit 
in the webbing between his Ugh. thumb and forefinger. All the way through. All clean through by a dog-sized rat. The same. <laughs> the same one. And oh boy, they do a the great job. The makeup's fucking good. In the movie, yeah. He uh, throws it down and like, the way oh. it's described as paralyzing his arm as though he just got, you know, a freezing cold mm-hmm. shock. Like the insanely yeah, before the terrifying. Pain. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And then he has to like, stomp it to death because it keeps not dying. <laughs> this, th- this, I kind of, it didn't hit me in the book that bad. But when Thomas Jane stomps on that rat and yeah. keeps stomping, mm. it's pretty intense. Yeah. It, it get and surrounded by all that bloody money on the floor. Just a lot of animal trauma. In this. It's also mm-hmm. it's also just a little different. I mean, we just talked about it in drawing of the three with Eddie in the naked gunfight. But mm-hmm. just being naked mm-hmm. adds a whole level mm-hmm. to how horrifying mm-hmm. he stomped on that rat naked, and that makes me scared. Yeah, Which is true. why we all love Annie Wilkes so much. Is <laughs> she's naked the entire book? Right? Is that just how I yeah. read it? <laughs> weird (laughs) so the infection begins to spread because he he can't get away the storm has turned into a uh, bit of a a winter bluster and uh, part of his bar he hears part of his barn cave in Mm. he moves the one surviving cow into the house (laughs) i love that we get it in the movie (laughs) it's not brought up (laughs) but a cow just walks in front of the camera (laughs) I also like the the touch in the movie that the leak in the ceiling isn't fixed. Yeah, he takes out the mortgage to give himself work to keep him busy and then doesn't do anything. Not only does he not do anything, but everything falls apart even more. It Mm -hmm. gets worse. It's so cool. And he is sick as hell. The infection is looking like lobstrosities attacked him. Yeah. Which the effect in the movie. Oh, boy. (laughs) And Star Wars over here. (laughs) He's woken up one night and he watches Arlette walk in the door with a group of rats. This fucking rules. This was cool in the movie. The the way they did it. Because it's the front door. or No, the the back door Mm -hmm. kept banging open with the wind and then it would close. And there's like flapper music playing in the distance. So creepy. And it does it again. And all of a sudden she's there. And so he starts to retreat into the house, ends up falling backwards down the steps to the basement and comes to rest at the foot of the stairs as the rats pour down with her slowly making her way toward him. I want to know how they did this scene because the actress walking down the stairs and there is just this carpet of rats Mm -hmm coming down the stairs with her and the whole time I'm like don't step on the rats yes I mean I was so anxious that she was gonna step on a rat but it looks the visual is so cool especially at the end of it's focusing him on him at the bottom of the stairs and the rats start piling up around his legs and you just know she is coming it's so good the the shot where it's from behind his head and his ear is in silhouette and she Mm -hmm. bares her teeth at his ear and you start hearing whispers despite Mm -hmm. the fact her mouth is not moving you they're not like you hear whispering but it's not there's no enunciation at Mm -hmm. all so it's almost like this just horrifying exhalation of breath Mm -hmm. That's like forming a story in his ear. And she whispered to me secrets that only a dead woman can know. Fuck. So cool. Which leads us into how he finds out what he reports to us in the book. Because in the book, he kind of, he, he starts and he starts telling us about what Hank has been up to. And then he's like, and I know you're asking myself, how would I know that? I know it because my dead wife told me. Well, and then he goes and he researches all of it. So Later, who yeah, knows? Also true. But well, wait, but bef- at the time of writing, he could have found all that out. Also true. Also true. So he's still unreliable. We, oh, so we good. never know. <laughs> I do love that. The, the ending makes it very clear. We do not know. Mm-hmm. I can't wait to get there. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, so he he we get this montage of uh, Hank who robs some banks and like convenience stores mm-hmm. and whatnot, buys a gun, finds in the book we find out the way he found not Susan. So smart. Shannon. Uh, Shannon 
is by staking out a candy shop mm-hmm. and waiting for a pregnant girl that smokes. <laughs> uh, yep. He's got That's a conniving so man in him. Yeah, he's <laughs> it's clever and like Wilf is like kind of impressed <laughs> by how sly he mm-hmm. is. Become. How smart he was about it. Yeah. yeah, but murder makes you sly. You have to it's a survival mm-hmm. mechanism, yes. he says. Uh, but long story short, he finds, he makes the connection with Shannon and they escape and become Bonnie and Clyde. Mm-hmm. The sweetheart bandits. Fucking where I thought this story was no. going. Oh, yeah. This Same. was a surprise. Yeah. I love the the way they got their name, too, is way more innocent than I thought. Because at, this, yeah. at the time, they're named that they haven't hurt anybody. Mm-hmm. And they get robbed themselves, and so they make their way to a nearby farmhouse, and they hold up that person. And then he gets a note later that clearly she wrote that says, like, we're sorry, we robbed you, we really needed the help, and we'll, you know, we'll try to make it up to you, the sweetheart bandits. And they continued robbing until... We uh, had to escalate to violence. Mm-hmm. A bank robbery went wrong. And, no, well, they were well, at a restaurant. No, that I'm not. I'm talking oh, about the first oh, time oh, Henry sorry. shoots oh, somebody. Oh my gosh! Yeah, Henry uh, shoots a security guard through the thigh, and the later guy loses the leg. Yeah, and later Wilfred interviews the guy. And, the guy's super gracious about it. Yeah, because yeah, he's seem like, like good kids. They seem yeah. like good. He's also uh, he's like it's on me. I honestly should have seen that he was either going to leave. He was going to leave one way or the other. I shouldn't have. He, drawn he recognized on him, that he escalated the situation right. unnecessarily for what? For money. <laughs> mm-hmm. But then we get to their penultimate stop, and mm-hmm. that is at a diner where the person working behind the counter recognized them, pulled a gun on them. They tried to get away, pulled the pulled the trigger, and click nothing. So what did what did Henry do? Henry, super relieved, is like, oh, thank goodness. Takes the gun away from him. Looks. The what is it? The, the shells are the shells are corroded. Or something, they're, yeah. They're um, uh, they're green. Yeah. yeah. So he's just like, oh, okay, cool. Well, we're gonna go. <laughs> Deuces. Turns his back on the guy. Doesn't take the shells. And as we know from the drawing of the three, some of those can know. fire. Yep. And he, uh, Shannon, gets shot through the back, through the stomach. Mm. And then the guy tries to fire again, and the gun explodes and takes off half his face. Well, yeah, like, don't shoot a pregnant woman. Right. (laughs) They get in the truck and drive off until they lose control and hide out in a farm where Shannon bleeds to death. Well, before she does, she says, the baby's dead and I want to die too. Yep. And uh, Henry uh, shoots himself in the head. Mm -hmm. And it is uh, days later that they are found because... Timing wise, this is all happening when she is whispering these things Mm -hmm. is the same storm that they are dying in. Mm -hmm. And so Wilfred wakes up in the morning. Sheriff Jones is at his door and he is there to tell him about Henry and Shannon having run away in Mm -hmm. the first place. And Wilfred confesses in a manner of speaking. (laughs) <laughs> this this maybe is the part of the story that I didn't buy the well, most. Well, because we we didn't get the whole line. Yeah. In this moment, yeah. he's he gives us the whole line later. Yeah. He yeah. says, and it's like it. Sorry, it takes me back to the book argument. Mm. It's a book. You can put it anywhere. That's true. That's true. <laughs> Give us the whole line. So Classic. then later when he's like explaining why that confession didn't amount to anything, yep. it's like, mm-hmm. okay, that makes sense. Classic book argument. Yeah. Yep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cause he, he says, I killed her. Didn't I? But we don't get the, but didn't we I. don't get the, didn't I? And then it's thrown in as like, uh, he learns, we learn that, uh, Wilfred's mother was English, wasn't she? I guess. <laughs> wasn't she? And had a habit of making statements into questions. And because he said, I killed her, didn't I? The sheriff, who also does the same thing, assumed that he was speaking metaphorically. And because he was also delirious from fever, doesn't mm-hmm. take it as a confession. Well, it's helped by the fact that the sheriff finds a the corpse of a woman who just r- sincerely matches Arlette's description. She's missing the same teeth. Maybe you should have asked that question uh, af- like more strategically, <laughs> not right. fed Wilfred like, hey, she's missing two back teeth. Missing teeth right? What about your wife who's hey, missing? That could yeah. have been a trick. 
he, but we, before and we he answered, we should have said how many, like, what's your, what's hey, her tooth situation, what's man? Your, <laughs> what's your wife's teeth like? Well, yeah, what, what's Devin's teeth count? Twenty-eight, thirty-two. Mine's twenty-eight. See, you don't know. Twenty-seven. You're not sure. I oh don't my God. know how many <laughs> teeth a person's supposed to have. See, Ben <laughs> could murder someone. Forty ah! teeth. <laughs> Ben's capable of murder. A- ask me how many that, teeth I have. How many teeth do you 300? have? Three hundred. Nice. Is that right? <laughs> That's. A scary this is amount. going nowhere. <laughs> They're mostly in a jar at home. <laughs> <laughs> so Wilfred wakes up. His hand is gone. <laughs> the infection mm-hmm. had spread. Mm-hmm. They had to remove it. Uh, and the sheriff says, hey, don't blame yourself for your wife's death. I know you tried to tell me it's all your fault. No. I, nobody could have known. We found a skeleton of a woman. You said she took jewelry and money because this body had none of that. So we're assuming. <laughs> and, and, the, and she had one leather shoe. And Wilford recalls, I said she was wearing her canvas shoes. He doesn't remember that I said that. The leather shoes were under the bed. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's, he's a terrible sheriff. <laughs> That's also like, what? Months later in a case that they had all kind of assumed was solved. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Wilfred goes home to discover that all of his animals besides one have died. He, uh, which is kind of what we get that reference to in the movie. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And uh, a week later, the sheriff comes out to tell him that Shannon and Henry have been found dead and that Henry had killed himself. And the bodies are coming back this week. We didn't mention he did try to tell the sheriff. That he had to stop what was happening and save oh, Henry. Yeah. yeah, because it, they weren't dead mm. at the quite. time. Yeah. 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 But, uh, God, and then we also get this scene in the movie. After the body gets here, Wilfred gets to see Henry. Jesus. Ooh. The makeup. This is why I was disappointed that the movie didn't lean more into the horror moments because mm-hmm. the ones it did lean into were very upsetting yeah. and it would have been a much more uncomfortable movie to watch. It has is it why some... it would be more is it that why it's more impactful though? That the like I'm still thinking about Hank's face. Yeah, mm. but I think if I don't know, I guess I just wanted the movie like the book it's is so not... brutal. Mm-hmm. It seems tame. Yeah. It was really good, but yeah. and and the one of my favorite parts of the book is that like before uh Arlette has been killed, there's that moment where he's like As she's passed out, he can feel her willpower in the room. And he says, this is a ghost story after all. But the ghost of the woman was still there before she had been killed. And Mm. I was like, shit, that's cool. Yeah, I love it. And I love a ghost story. And yeah, this feels like the ghost is kind of, it's there, but. It's not the main main focus. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So next, Wilfred decides. Enough's enough. I can't handle this anymore. I'm going to sell that hundred acres because Arlette's been declared dead. It's all his now. Mm -hmm. So he, but he's not going to sell it to those fucking hog farmers at Farrington. He's going to go sell it to his neighbor. And that conversation goes poorly. It's the land is tainted and we get that from the neighbor, but later indications seem that this guy is just like an outcast now. Nobody wants anything to do with him or anything he owns like it's, everything he touches is poison. That it, the book doesn't say that, but that's because he he tries to sell it to him for pennies on the dollar, basically. And he's like, you know, my wife left me because she said that I am a stubborn fool, and if I hadn't done what I did, then our daughter would still be alive. And she's right. Mm-hmm. It is brutal. Yeah, <laughs> it's fucking. It's hard. But he turns him down because, and he says, "Go sell it to the bank." And he says, "Well, if I sell it to the bank, they'll sell it to those hog farmers." And dude the cannot whole let thing, go of his pride. <laughs> I cannot let that river have hog guts in it. Mm-hmm. I will not stand for this. And Harlan says, "Well, f- tough shit." And it's it's so and there's an added like historical tragedy because this is happening in 1922 Mm -hmm. and throughout the book they keep dropping that's like the the depression is coming all of this is for nothing yeah it does not like he obviously in retrospect should have sold it because they're going to lose everything regardless because the fucking dust bowl is about to happen Mm -hmm. yeah he said this is the last year crops yeah were any money essentially um, and, but and I also love that when he goes to try to sell it to the bank, the bank says they don't want it. And he knows full well mm-hmm. 
there that somebody got to them and Did now they? you just have to wait for him. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I think so. I, it, it could go, I, I took it as his paranoia. Me too. At that point. That's what I did too, because everybody's out to get him. And also, this is the point where he's starting to see rats everywhere. <laughs> he, he just seems so like unhinged mm-hmm. that from this, basically around this time, I took everything as paranoia. Well, it's a combination of both. Which because is fun because it could be either way. I mean, yeah, yeah. He, he's paranoid that specific people he knows are out to get him. <laughs> yeah. But it is actually a (laughs) minor conspiracy because the bank and this hog butcher are Are, actually working together to drive out all the little people. Mm -hmm. So it is misplaced paranoia. (laughs) So we'll get to the epilogue because Wilford eventually has to sell the 100 acres. We haven't even talked about the thi- we'll get there. <laughs> uh, and we hear a little bit about what his life was like after that. He moved to Omaha. He got a job working in a factory until he started seeing rats. He basically has the life, like in a way that Arlette wanted. Mm-hmm. They're living in the city. I mean, He's yeah. working. She could have. <laughs> he get, he forges credentials and starts working at a library, which I think is great. Mm. Uh, and he was happy there. Until he started seeing rats again. Well, nobody believed him, but, and this yeah. again is why I thought he's yep. paranoid because at first he's like, you know, I kept seeing the the rats on the floor, like when he was moving pallets mm-hmm. in the warehouse and he was trying to like tell them like, hey, got a rat infestation. He's like, and nobody else would admit to seeing them, but I think it's because they didn't want to lose wages. They were worried mm-hmm. that it would be shut yeah. down. It's like, he gives There's you just food, enough, yeah. like okay, you know what? He could be telling Mm -hmm. the truth or he could be crazy. There's this fucking awesome shot in the movie where it's after he, it shows him working in this factory hauling pallets and he looks up and there are rats in the rafters and then it cuts to him sitting in this dark, dank bar and it's like the camera's just a little offset and you see, as soon as it cuts off, you see a rat along the baseboard run off camera and it is unremarked upon, it is unseen by him and it's so fast it's like blink and you miss it but it's such a cool shot of like is it there (laughs) are they always there in the end he has decided that all that's left for him to do is check into a hotel write his confession he bought a gun uh from a pawn shop just like hank did luckily the rats are gonna wait for him to write his confession before they eat him he will (laughs) shoot himself about this (laughs) He's going to shoot himself in the head after he finishes writing his confession. Because as he's been writing, he is remarking that he has been continually being surrounded by more and more mm-hmm. rats in his room mm-hmm. as the story has gone. Yeah, in in the book and movie, they do it differently. And I fucking love it both ways. Yeah, Because in the movie, every time the rats come up, the first time the rats come up is it when he looks down the well and sees all the rats. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or it's something happens. So, yeah. And no, it was after the it bites the cow is the first oh, the time pipe. it oh, sees yeah, the goes, rat yeah. running up the pipe. And then all of a sudden in the middle of the scene, it cuts to him in the hotel. Mm. Yeah. And you hear gnawing noises and he looks behind him and there's a crack in the wall starting to form. Mm-hmm. So and then un, he turns back and changes the subject. And stops talking about rats. Mm. And it goes on. And every time the rats come, it cuts back to him. And the hole is opened up. And there are rats crawling out of the wall. And the next time, he turns around. And the room is just fucking (laughs) full of rats. (laughs) I love that. But I also love it in the book. It does the same thing. Except for the first time he mentions it, he's like... Well, the rats lining the walls of the room are sitting and waiting for me to finish so they can eat me. But they're not gonna because I'm gonna kill myself first. Let's see them try. And I'm like, what? That's insane. Also, before we move on, one more rats thing. Completely unrelated. It's in the book and it made me laugh so hard. He gets a job as a librarian and an old lady asks for a encyclopedia oh my, botanica yeah. and he's like i got it for her and it was the ish- <laughs> <laughs> okay. and it was it was the encyclopedia britannica for r a to s t <laughs> <laughs> and i'm like 
<laughs> oh no, that spells rest. <laughs> That's so scary. <laughs> that is really good. So he uh, treats it as like a, can you believe it? <laughs> I'm being haunted. <laughs> and the rest of the book, I was like, oh, look out for the rats. <laughs> the rats. It's so scary. Uh, I think so that's a, a very funny part of his epilogue. To me, the saddest part of the epilogue is as he's retracing Henry's steps, he sits mm. in the alley where he met Victoria, mm-hmm. the girl that passed along the message mm-hmm. that helped uh, everybody that helped the escape happen. And he says that uh, his fantasy about if he could run into that girl and mm-hmm. give her a message isn't to say, Hank, don't do this. It's to say, Hank, the farm needs you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Your dad needs you. He's so selfish yes. the whole time. So as he puts the finishing touches on this note, he starts to hear footsteps. Three sets of footsteps. And he knows who those footsteps belong to. They're coming for him. And as he see, feel, hears them coming, he starts searching for the gun. And the gun is gone. <laughs> And then he begs for them not to eat him because they start biting him while he's writing. The audiobook is interesting because <laughs> he's getting bitten mm-hmm. and he's like trying to finish telling us what's mm-hmm. happening. And it just cuts him off mid like scream. Yeah. Oh, and good. then it's the the, the epilogue article. and it's a different narrator. That's so mm-hmm. smart. Yeah. I'm so glad that <laughs> the article's a different narrator. Who wants to talk about the article? Oh yeah, the the article is from uh, what just a reporter, like the newspaper, 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 newspaper or yeah. whatever. Yeah, that this man was discovered in a hotel room with this long written confession, and no, it's what? they don't know it was a confession oh, because no. he ate the paper. Oh, that's that he right. Was yeah. writing on. I fucking <laughs> didn't even make that connect. Yeah, because he's like, I never seen anything like this. I never want to again. Because he had chewed himself apart. He had (laughs) torn open his wrists with his teeth and torn up all these shreds of paper that made it look like a rat's nest. (laughs) Cool. Okay. Is it? uh, Well, (laughs) it's so goofy. (laughs) It's so goofy. The the, the ending of the movie, awesome. Yeah. I Mm -hmm. love the ending. ending. great. But this ending, the fact that the entire thing is set up as him writing, this is his written confession. Mm -hmm. And then the last paragraph is him writing, oh, no, stop biting me. Ow, this really hurts. Yeah. Yeah. Is he writing? He's writing all of this? Okay, it's the found footage issue with the movies because how are we reading it if he Mm -hmm. ate it? Right. And then because he's an unreliable narrator. Did he eat his own I, I don't know. Yeah, I, it was. It's very like. Oh, let's, sure, he killed himself. The rats weren't real. Okay, but yeah, the the fact <laughs> that, that we're just in the middle of this that the entire time I'm like, this is a written confession, and suddenly he's writing. Ooh, ow, they're biting me, and yeah. I'm like, that's goofy. I wouldn't write that I was being bitten as I was being yeah, bitten. exactly. Because I'd just be screaming. Anyway, we're getting too. <laughs> Let's talk about how the movie ends, because that I think we're all agreeing it's that was a really bit good. cooler. Sam? <laughs> he turns around, and it's not just a bunch of rats. It is three really like great makeup in this movie, yeah. by the way. We started to talk about it, then I got sidetracked with the sun. Mm-hmm. Alarming visuals here. It's Hank, Shannon, and Arlette standing there and Hank has the butcher knife. Passes it over to Arlette. And it just like cuts to black. And I was thinking, man, I hope, I hope they just end it here. I want to see the, the names pop up. And then it did. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really good. It is a striking image. The three of them standing in the middle of the room and then cutting back to him with this just absolute abject horror on his Mm -hmm. face. It is very, once again, the end of Pet Cemetery. We also like, get a lot of flashbacks here as he, you know, this is happening to her alive, like mm-hmm. it, almost like his regret of like all these moments when yeah. things like he thought things were bad, but that was like <laughs> really the good time in his life before mm-hmm. he killed his wife. So should we rate it? What Should we rate the book first, then the movie? Yeah. Okay. Separate? Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, let's see. I'm going to go with the, the short story. Like I said, it's, or the novella. It's, I love a dense fucking idiot getting exactly what he deserves and it being so much worse than, uh, mm-hmm. than you expect it to be. Uh, a five out of five blue chambray shirts. All those things are true. And I just hate that kind of story <laughs> just because it's not, it just makes me feel so gross, which is what it's, you know, it's affected sure, and sure. that it does that. But I, I said like a year ago, and then I have really not done it. I'm going to be honest from now on. Mm-hmm. I'm going to give it four out of five blue shampoo shirts. Good Lord. What is happening? <laughs> um, yeah, it, I, I agree. We were talking uh, yesterday at studio producer Devin's birthday party. Uh, CM and I were talking about how this was a tough read mm-hmm. and I was really expecting it to be a repeat of apt pupil where uh, it is very apt pupil pupil though. I'm glad you brought that it up. It has the, that vibe. It's like, Oh, gross. It's gross. And unhappy. The and characters unpleasant. are miserable, awful people, but it is riveting. Mm-hmm. It's written incredibly well. It has this like very, ish like structure and like I said it's gothic horror which I think is sick I enjoyed isn't the right word (laughs) but it is I I think this is a great novella five out of five blue chambray shirts so I'm it's very odd one out I guess so rare yeah, that this I rank the it last higher novellas than novellas that we did. Yeah, though. that's right. I have a problem with the novellas. Apparently. Well, because it's a perfect medium to explore really shitty characters that nobody likes. You don't have to like take the reader yes. on this prolonged journey. You don't have to make us mm. want to be with this character. So it's like the perfect platform. Oh, <laughs> this um, I, I meant to say this earlier, and I, I said it in our group chat. I think that this novella rum, like gives me the vibes of a longer version of LT's theory of pets in a bit yeah. of a way. Yeah, yeah, kind of. Um, I the, I kind of just like the. <laughs> I talked when I read that story that I wanted more of that story, and this was kind of that in a weird way for me. They're Ooh, they're not I'm one to one by any <laughs> means, but like I don't know why they feel the same for me. Uh, let's go movie. Um, I'll go first again. Tom Jane, five. No, <laughs> <laughs> that's dark. Uh, I you mean, took my rating. <laughs> he's, uh, yeah, it's it's really good. It's very faithful. It's mm-hmm. the thing we love about novella adaptations. Here's the thing. Still, probably just like ten minutes too long <laughs> for me. It needs yeah. to be like a a touch shorter. And uh, the the casting for Harlan was was not right. So I'm gonna go four out of five blue chambray shirts. I thought it was a really good, like you said, faithful adaptation. Tom Jane, man, just really <laughs> like, although I do not appreciate seeing him as this character. Mm-hmm. Makes me very confused. <laughs> <laughs> I This is a better or worse than uh, Skarsgård's flag. He, he was hot. His flag was amazing. <laughs> well, we he saw was, his naked butt. But he was, he was <laughs> hot, hot, evil he guy. Was hot, evil. So what's the difference? So. This guy's not evil. He's pathetic. Oh, yep. there it is. Yep. Yep. He's Absolutely not, true. If you're going to be evil, you also have to be cool or you're just <laughs> not fuckable. <laughs> That's fucking four out of five. Blue fucking pictures. truth bombs over here. <laughs> Holy shit. Dropping truth. In that the was ratings. wise as fuck. Wow. You're welcome. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, I can't follow that up. Um, it, it was a good movie. I agree with Josh that it was a tad bit mm-hmm. too long. I wish the the kid would have been a little younger yeah. and a little more pathetic as well. Mm-hmm. But it was it was beautifully shot, and Thomas Jane was really incredible. I'd say four out of five blue chambray shirts for this one. Yeah. That's it for this episode of Dairy Public Radio. As always, thank you for listening. Join us for our next episode where we will be covering the story and movie Big Driver. For Benjamin Graham and CM Alexander, I'm Joshua Khan reminding you, sometimes the only thing to do is take the thing you must have, even if someone gets hurt, even if someone dies. Hey everyone, CM Alexander here. Thank you for listening to 1922. We hope you enjoyed it. As always, you can share your thoughts with us on our Facebook or Instagram at Dairy Public Radio or X at Dairy Public. 
You can also send us an email at dairypublicradio at gmail.com. And don't forget to check out our Etsy store for merchandise and our Patreon for bonus episodes at the $5 and up tier. Just search Dairy Public Radio on both of those platforms. That's all for now, listeners. Goodbye.